Yeah, I started normally enough drinking, you know, as a mm. young person. And uh, I suppose still looking back, like I grew up in Innes, it was a pretty big drinking town. And mm. you were in pubs from quite a young age, from probably the age of 14 onwards, it was fairly accepted to be drinking in a bar. Um, and there was a lot of street drinking and all of that. And I suppose looking back, though, when I look back on it, any time I was drinking or was drunk, there were issues, you know, for sure. And it, it wasn't dramatic initially, you know, it built up gradually over time. Um, and probably even by the age of 17, 18, probably most people around me wouldn't have said that I had a major problem. Though I sometimes wonder if I'd grown up in America, would that have been the case? Like maybe from a lot earlier, people would have been saying, listen, you gotta, you got to deal with this thing here. It's having a real impact on you. It's changing your personality in a profound way. But obviously Ireland, we have such a high tolerance level as a society for yeah. problem drinking. We don't name it. Um, that you're, you're camouflaged really for a long time. I think you can progress throughout your late teens, early 20s. You can have a relationship, you can be in college, you can seemingly have it together. But at the same time, you can have this very dysfunctional relationship like I did with alcohol. Mm. And it was a time too where we glorified drinkers in Ireland. You know, yeah. we uh, we sort of celebrated it. We People talk about uh, the stereotypical Paddy, the punch drunk. And when I was writing the first book, I remember going back and looking at representations of Irish people in the 19th century in, in British media. And it was invariably like uh, an Irish person with kind of monkey features, always drunk, always beating people up. And it sort of rankles with you when you see that and you think that's not a stereotype I, I like. But then when I was growing up, certainly we used to stereotype ourselves all the time mm. every St. Patrick's Day we used to sell this image of ourselves abroad yeah. and the drunken Irish and the presidents come here you put the point in their but hand I think the thing about stereotypes is there's always an element of truth or fact <laughs> totally, behind yeah. the stereotype yeah. you know so it wasn't really till I progressed through college and then it started to have a profound impact um, I became a dad quite young I think it was 22 didn't deal with that quite well probably and the drinking accelerated and accelerated and it got to a point then where it was definitely i was i suppose a regular binge drinker is how i'd probably describe it and i would have realized that it was certainly an issue not to the extent where i thought i needed to particularly do anything about it because a lot of the people i was around were uh, having a pretty good time as well you know mm. um few things started to happen like I suppose by my mid-twenties I realised okay I don't have a house really or I don't have a place to stay I was sleeping on a friend's mattress in a friend's house job was very sporadic I'd get a bit of work here and there didn't feel good about myself when I got up in the morning and had a look at myself in the mirror increasingly felt darker and darker and felt this isn't the life I should have and couldn't quite figure out why and obviously knew that drink primarily drink now there were drugs involved as well but it was primarily drink was the issue mm. and uh, by the age of 26 27 i was in a lot of debt i'd alienated a lot of people had limited enough uh, interaction with my son at the time um for what about your relationship with the mother of your child at the time it wasn't great when but we broke up you, you, but you were throughout or you broke up we, so we yeah we met when we were quite young and then we stayed together i think till my son was three and then we broke up and um, now at the moment, like today, it's fantastic and it's great. Yeah. And we, we got on really well. But yeah, definitely, I like I'd say, I was I was uh, fairly difficult. What was your career like when you left college and the drinking escalated and the relationship breakdown? <laughs> I've had about 20 careers, but the career initially, I went to college, did English and history. Then got this kind of scholarship thing to do Irish land history, which I was fascinated in. Uh, halfway through that decided I'd be an actor right you know you've never seen me in that and I was at a spectacular disaster <laughs> failure as an actor right <laughs> and I uh, did a couple of small plays in the opera a few other things then what did I do then I think I got into IT everybody was doing computer I did a C programming course in computers and FOSS and got a job half I didn't have to finish the course now got people were coming in just giving people yeah. jobs like you were into IT grand yeah, I can program I couldn't <laughs> were, then, you, well, <laughs> were, you, were you quiet were you a quiet person I wasn't really like I was always quite outgoing yeah. and I was always that so I was quiet if you, like if you met me like this now I wouldn't have had this type of confidence to talk but I mm. would have when I'd had a few drinks and yeah. I felt yeah. that I became myself when I had a few drinks so the it was drink. that yeah. thing where without even realising it I had come to rely on alcohol I thought to bring out my personality mm. to be emotional 
to you know engage with sex like all of those formative things alcohol was involved and then it just became more and more of a crutch Mm. so media wise i had began in the irish examiner i think and began in local newspapers so the media career was building it was very stop start i wouldn't turn up for jobs i turn up drunk i might i might go missing for a few days so that wasn't really happening to the way it should have been and then really it came to a point where my parents intervened, like the family had an intervention and they asked, would I meet them over by St. Finbar's Hospital one day and the whole family were there, you know. And by this stage now, I don't think I had been home to a lot, you know, I'd taken money and stuff and I'd had a lot of debt. Were you able to hide it because your family was in Clare and you were in car? Probably a bit more, but it came to a point where there was no hiding it when you owed money yeah. or there was no hiding it when... I'd go home and my behaviour was completely erratic or mm. I'd go missing for a few weeks, you know, or I suppose they knew that my relationship with my son wasn't great. They knew I probably didn't have a fixed place to live at that time. I'd, I'd got a place and I'd been evicted from it because I didn't pay the rent basically after only about three weeks. Um, so they intervened. It was like an intervention with a family therapist, I think, over by St. Finbar's Hospital, which had Arbor, Lo- Arbor Hill. Arbor House. Arbor House, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And to be honest, I was kind of glad at that point and was happy enough that they were calling it what it was. They were just saying, this is how you're drinking at the moment is affecting all of us individually and hard to hear. But they asked me then in Arbor House, is it something that you'd like to do something about? Would you come back to us next week? And I came back to them for a couple of weeks. They'd urine test me every week. I think I stayed clean for about two out of the three weeks or something. And at that point in, they suggested going to Tabor Lodge to a 28-day program. Like, to be totally honest, for me, I was thinking, that's a month now where I don't have to worry about getting a place to stay. I don't have to worry about bills. Mm. I, that, that sounds all right. Yeah. So I kind of committed to it on that basis where it might give me a bit of breathing space. But, you know, I owed a few quid and it might get people off my back for a while here if I do this. And that was sort of my attitude going in. Um... So a friend, uh, Liam Heffernan, who's an actor who played Blackie Connors in Glenroe, dropped me down to Tabor Lodge. Good. <laughs> Great mate of mine, was always there for me when I needed him. You know, always gave me a couch back in the day and we're still good mates. He's living down in Dingle now. Just became a dad. Probably. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, mm-hmm. great guy. So Liam dropped me down to Tabor Lodge <laughs> with my stuff in the plastic bag. And What uh, are you feeling as your... I was rattled. Yeah. Was absolutely rattled. I'd managed to stay off it for about a week or two beforehand, which was good, I thought because it gave me a little bit of a base where I, I didn't have to come down like t- to the same extent as, as many of the people I met. But as I was walking in the door of Tabor Lodge, there was a guy outside, right? And he called, called me over to the side and he said, um, what, what are you in for? And I said, uh, it's mostly drink. And he said, right. And he said, what about the drugs? And I said, I sort of, yeah, I mean, definitely an issue. Like, but what if to, it was going? Like, yeah, <laughs> but not to the same yeah. extent. And he said, do you gamble? I said, well, I, like every year in the Gold Cup, I'd put a fiver on one horse. He said, don't tell him. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and he said, uh, I came in with one addiction. I have two now and they're not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it worked, really. Uh, yeah. so, so I was in there going, Jesus Christ, what else am I going to have to admit to in yeah. here, right? So anyway, Tabor Lodge, that started it. And I suppose it started my whole other life then started. 